So this talk's going to be about uh, proof of the Riemann series rearrangement theorem. Is this all here? Okay. So the theorem says, so there's a previous talk where we, where we did the theorem, the statement of the theorem. And I'll just remind you of the trickiest part of it. So you have a series, it's called conditionally convergent. If the series converges, the series partial sums converge, sequence of partial sums converges, but the sequence of partial sums of absolute values doesn't converge. So it's not absolutely convergent. Okay. And, uh, then it's called conditionally convergent. And the theorem says that if you have a conditionally convergent series, then there's three things we know. The terms have to go to zero, the subseries of positive terms diverges, and the subseries of negative terms diverges. Okay? Uh, but the fourth one is a really interesting one. It says that if you have two things, which could be real numbers, but you're also allowed to have them negative infinity or infinity. Okay? Where this L is less than or equal to U, then you can rearrange the series such that the partial sums have lim inf equal to L and lim sup equal to U. Okay, and again in the previous video I explained what the lim inf and lim sup sort of mean. Okay, so I'm not going to go over the full explanation. Uh, but basically what we want to have is we want to say that there's a way of rearranging the series so you can get any sum you want and not just any sum you want, you can get any uh, lower and upper sum. So you can think of the lim inf of the partial sums as the lower sum and the lim sup of the partial sum as the upper sum. Okay, so we are going to prove 4 here based on 1, 2 and 3. So the previous video explained roughly why 1, 2 and 3 are true and now we are going to prove 4 based on that. And I'm going to give you a sketch of the proof. The full details are a little too much, so I'm just going to sketch the proof. So I'm going to assume that the series doesn't have any zero terms, okay? But the series could have repeated terms. So you could have a situation where some terms are equal to other terms, okay? So we, we have to be careful about that. Okay. So, uh, so here's the idea. We first, we have the series. We first divide it into the positive term subseries and the negative term subseries. So suppose I give you, say, uh, some series, I'm, I'm not putting the plus or minus signs in any particular way, but, uh, but uh, now I can separate this into the positive term subseries and the negative term subseries. So what do the positive term subseries be? One, one half, one fourth, one sixth, one seventh. Okay. And uh, the negative term subseries will be? Minus one third, minus one fifth, minus one eighth. Okay, good. So, uh, so these are the subseries. Now, the idea is simple. We will, what we want to do is we, we start with our original series. We construct the positive term subseries and the negative term subseries. And to construct the rearrangement of the series, we will not move things around within the positive and the negative things. We'll just sort of pick some things from the positive term subseries, then pick some things from the negative thing, then more from the positive, more from the negative, etc. Okay. So we're just going to sort of pick and choose. We're not going to change the ordering within the positive and the negative things. Now, if you wanted to, you could also rearrange the positive term subseries in descending or decreasing order of the sizes and the negative terms in increasing order, which would mean in decreasing order of magnitude. Uh, that's optional. Uh, to do that, you'd have to justify a bit more. So I, I won't assume that it's in decreasing or increasing order. I'm just picking them in whatever order. And in this case, they were already in uh, decreasing order, at least the first few things we wrote, decreasing here and increasing here, but I'm not assuming that uh, as in my general setup, okay? So, uh, so now let's try to do the proof. Okay, so let's just first remind ourselves uh, what are the partial sum done on the number line. So, you start with zero. To get the first partial sum, you move by the first term, okay? Say if it's positive, you're here. Then to get the second partial sum, you move from here by the second term, right? Mm -hmm. If it's positive, you move to the right. If it's negative, you move to the left, okay? So, you go like that. Maybe you move right, then maybe you move left. Right, right. So you, you do in some order, right? Depending on, on how, what the size. I'm not using this series. I'm just doing an arbitrary series. Okay. These, these arcs are just to indicate how I'm going. They're not, they're not part of the thing. 
So these points I have here, these are the partial sums. Okay. Okay. So with this picture, uh, pictorial uh, aid in mind, let's try to understand how you would construct a rearrangement for a given uh, L and a given U. Okay. So let's assume L and U are finite. Okay. Uh, I'll just put both of them on the right of zero. It doesn't really matter where they are relative to zero. They could both be left, right, whatever of zero. Okay. So how would you now construct your rearrangement? What would you do? So you have your positive term subsidies and your negative term subsidies. What did you do? Yeah? I'm not sure. Maybe you can start from the positive term section. Okay, let's let's start with the positive ones and uh, just start picking out and keep picking out positive terms, right? You keep getting here. Now when do you stop stop with picking the positive terms? Once you surpass you. Once you've crossed you. So once your partial sum is to the right of you, as soon as it becomes to the right of you, what do you start doing? Start going back. Pick the negative term subseries. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and uh, you're now somewhere to the left of L, right? Mm -hmm. uh, once you reach to the left of L, then what do you do? You resume picking positive terms. You resume picking positive terms. Move to the right of you, move to the left of L, and then so on. Okay. So you keep picking positive till you cross U, then keep picking negative till you come to the left of L, then positive till you go to the right of U, negative till you go to the left of L, and so on. Okay, now what you need to show here, well, first of all, why are we guaranteed that we will always be able to cross? So if you start with zero, why are we guaranteed we'll always be able to move to the right of U if we pick enough terms in the positive term subseries? Because hmm? the positive term subseries diverges. Diverges, right. And so the overall sum is infinity, which means you'll definitely be able to cross any finite point here. Okay, so yeah, right now we have they're both finite. Okay, so fine. Now, when you start moving back, why will you be able to cross L and move to the left of L? The same reason. Well, not well. You're using the negative term subsidies diverges. Okay. Now, once you're to the left of L, how do you know that if you now pick more positive terms, you'll be able to get to the right of you? Because you only take out. You've only taken out. Find a number of positive terms. You have even a number of positive terms left. And okay. You yeah. yeah. So you only take a finite thing of your infinite sum. So you can you still have infinite amounts. So you can definitely cross you, and then you can again uh, go back and forth. Now each time you do this back and forth, you will use up at least one term of your positive series when going like this, and at least one term of your negative series when you are going that way. Do you see that? Well, because you're starting on the left of L and going to the right of U, right? And L is less than or equal to U, which means you have to use at least one term each time, right? Which means each time you alternate, you're using up at least one term of your series. And since you're doing this infinitely many times, you ultimately end up using everything. Okay. So, uh, we use everything. So it's a rearrangement of the original series, right? Because we used up every term. Okay, and we used it up like uh, exactly once, right? I mean, if there's rep repeated terms, it will use up as many times as it's repeated. Okay, so what do we need to show now? Well, we need to show that the lim inf in this rearrangement is L and the lim sup in this rearrangement is U. How would you do that? Well, what do we need to show? We need to show that if you are at, let's say, L minus epsilon, okay, then uh, for any epsilon greater than zero, then eventually all the terms, all the partial sums, sorry, will remain to the right of L minus epsilon, sorry, will remain to the right of L minus epsilon. Okay, eventually the partial sums will be to the right of L minus epsilon. Why is that? Well, when does it ever go to the left of L? Each time you go back, there's one partial sum which is to the left of L, right? Because usually it remains between L and U, right? 
but each time there's one there's one partial sum which is to the left of l which is up which is the uh, point after which it, at which it decides to start moving back up right yeah so can we be guaranteed that these ones will eventually remain to the right of l minus epsilon hmm as the term goes to zero okay so what you're saying is that well this partial sum is the previous one which is uh, bigger than l plus some negative term right so since the previous one is bigger than bigger than or equal to l therefore the amount by which this can be less than l is at most the size of that term okay so this distance the distance from l to your uh, partial sum which is to its left is at most the size of some large ak or ak for large k right and we know that for large k ak will eventually be going to zero right ak is approaching zero and therefore these overshoots the overshoot on the left of l approaches zero which means that eventually eventually all these overshoots will be less than epsilon which means that eventually all the partial sums will be to the right of l minus epsilon so the lim inf cannot be anything uh, less than l it has to be uh greater than or equal to l and because everything does keep coming near l the lim inf is not greater than l either so the lim inf is exactly l okay similarly the lim sup is exactly u because for any epsilon you can do a similar argument to show that eventually all the overshoots will become smaller than epsilon and therefore all the terms will eventually remain to the left of u plus epsilon okay so far so good uh, a special case would be when l equals u in that case you just have like a single number here and you just keep picking terms till you go to the right of that then you keep picking terms till you get back to its left and you keep picking terms till you go to its right and so on okay so i mean the same proof does work when l equals u it's it's, it's a lot easier i mean you don't have to hop this distance each time You're just going back and forth around the number okay so we used all three of these conditions right where did we use the positive term subseries diverges hmm we use for the fact that if we start from the positive terms we will go over u eventually yeah so each time we'll be able to go from l to u each time we are we are to the left of l you can go back to the right of u what were the negative term subseries diverging you can go back to L. Yeah, just to the right of you, you can go back to the left of it. Uh, so each time you, I mean, each time you need only a finite amount of movement, but since you're doing that infinitely many times, overall you need an infinite amount of movement. And where did we use this condition? Uh, we can prove that L and U are, are limits. Are uh, precisely the limit and limit, so, right? That the overshoots are actually going to go to zero. Okay. Uh, now this proof maybe it's a little more in intuitive like what is happening if you if the if you rearrange your series initially positive and negative term subseries in decreasing order for the positive ones and increasing order for the negative ones increasing order for negative things means it's uh, uh, decreasing order of magnitude in that case you're sort of just picking out the largest things and keeping on picking smaller and smaller things however you don't need to do that rearrangement initially you can just use the series as they are okay uh what next so we have to now worry about let's use this one so we have to now worry about the case where uh l is finite uh u is infinity what happens in this case what's your strategy let's say l is positive it doesn't really matter and u is at infinity what do you do hmm i'm sure Okay, well, you definitely cannot go all the way to infinity and then come back, right? There's no coming back from infinity, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay. so what do you do instead? Instead of going all the way to infinity the first time, you just go all the way to some finite number the first time, come back to L. Then next time you go all the way to a bigger number, come back to L, and you keep doing this, and. Uh, and you, you you make sure that the sequence of the upper things you keep going up to goes to infinity okay so you choose a sequence choose a, let's let's say for convenience you don't have to do it this way but choose an increasing sequence 
u1 less than u2 less than u3 with lim the limit has to be infinity and uh, l is less than u1 okay now you do the same procedure you start with zero you start from zero do the partial sums till you've crossed uh, u1 then the partial sums then uh, start picking negative terms till you've crossed l to the left of l then you start picking positive terms again till you cross u2 then negative terms till you've crossed l and so on okay now you see the limit will still be l for the same reason hmm? but the limb soup is now no longer finite because you'll have arbitrarily large sums okay you have arbitrarily large uh, uh, partial sums for large k right okay good now what if uh, if l were minus infinity and u were infinity well just one two series two sequences yeah so you have one sequence like this of uh, for the positive things and you can make another sequence for the negative things and this one should go to infinity this one should go to negative infinity okay and uh, you can arrange it so that u1 is greater than l1 just to make sure you're always doing this oscillation business okay uh but what the, the, another interesting one i want to ask you is what if l and u uh, are both infinity yeah what if l and u are both infinity well can i just do two sequences two sequences and both of them have to go to infinity yeah and and moreover you should make it so that so sequence is always less than the like, other sequence oh it's just the corresponding terms yeah obviously not everything in the l can be less than everything in the u because they're both going to infinity okay if you, let's say you try to do this does this work well you you are you are picking out so the point is each time you go so so this, you have the same kind of logic right each time you are cycling between going up and going down right you are you are using up at least one term uh, in your series in the original series positive when you're going up negative when you're going down and so you will you will end up using everything okay good and and finally of course if l and u are equal then then that i mean in general they're finite equal then you you can show that the series can be rearranged to get any sum you want okay so what's the intuition behind this in the sense why do we have this apparently counterintuitive result that the sum actually uh, depends so heavily on the ordering that you can get any sum you want just by choosing an appropriate rearrangement what's going on maybe because you have infinite terms well you have infinitely many terms that's part of the reason but the other part of the reason is that the positive term subseries and the negative term subseries both diverge and so what's happening is in some sense you have an infinite amount of positive stuff and an infinite amount of negative stuff and when you have an infinite amount two infinite things then the order in which you add them really matters it's it, in general infinity minus infinity is indeterminate so the, the really the way in which you arrange your two infinities the way in which the rate at which you use these terms versus these terms that really uh, does matter let me just take one uh, concrete example this is but here's so ln2 has this series for it uh even if you didn't know it's ln2 you can show that this series converges by the alternating series theorem which if you haven't seen yet you'll hopefully see soon okay now what does the uh, riemann series rearrangement theorem tell us if weight 
pick Where any two numbers yeah. pick any two numbers like uh, 1 and 4 you can rearrange the series such that the limb inf of the partial sums is 1 and the limb sup of the partial sums is 4 okay or you could pick a uh, rearrangement so that the limb inf of the partial sums is 5 and the limb sup is infinity so in some sense this summation is not really well defined in the in the sense that you are just taking the total of the terms it's really very heavily dependent on the way you have ordered the terms because there's an infinite amount of positive stuff and an infinite amount of negative stuff so the ordering is really important okay